The emergence of artificial intelligence in society has elicited visceral reactions from people the world over, many of whom, thanks to portrayals in popular culture, can't quite decide whether they believe we are building the future or destroying it. While we feel relatively certain the killer robots of the Terminator universe aren't coming to get us at least anytime soon, there are distinct ethical uncertainties we must address now before empowering these autonomous systems to carry out the life and death scenarios of military operations. That's an emphasis of the research of School of Interactive Computing professor Ron Arkin, who will help us unpack some pretty heavy questions. Are we actually dealing with quote unquote killer robots? What is the public perception about them and why? Can we trust machine learning algorithms to make appropriate decisions in real time? And how much power should we turn over to these robots? I'm the School of Interactive Computing Chair Ayana Howard, and this is the Interaction Hour. We appreciate Professor Ron Arkin joining us again for a deeper discussion into ethics and robotics. It's just a sneak preview of the panel he and I will join in front of National Media and Congress on September 25th in Washington, D.C. Thanks again for joining us. My pleasure. All right, so let's get it out of the way. <laughs> Killer robots, are, are, are they really coming to get us? Not to get us, but is the technology actually being developed that can be used in the battlefield uh, to win wars? or to reduce non-combatant casualties? The answer is yes to that particular aspect of are they coming. But let's also not use the term killer robots if we can avoid using that. Killer robots actually came out of a paper by a colleague of mine from Australia. It was called, uh, when he started talking about uh, killer robots, his name was Robert Sparrow. It was latched onto by the press and many non-governmental organizations or NGOs, as I'll refer to uh, in the future of this discussion. But the United Nations, uh, in its discussions of this particular topic in Geneva, has referred to them as lethal autonomous weapon systems, or LAWS for short. To me, that's a more appropriate term to use because it doesn't bring up, as you said, the visceral response or the horrors of the science fiction movies that we've seen in the past, and it enables us as people discussing ethics to consider them logically and in some ways dispassionately about what is right and what is wrong uh, with this particular type of technology. So killer robots, you're saying is, it, there was a, one, it sounds kind of like fearful and f like, oh, what's going on, right? But at the end of the day, it's about our fear. So what is this fear that we have that, that robots, even the lethal autonomous weapon systems, which is basically a gentle version of, of saying robots with guns, killer robots, but why does this make us terrified? Well, one could go back to the actual origin of the word robot, which was from Carol Capek. Uh, he wrote a play called Rossum's Universal Robot, I don't know, in 1920 or something around then. Uh, and uh, it was, robot came from the word slave or worker. That play, although the robots weren't armed with weapons, didn't turn out well for humanity. Uh, spoiler alert, if you ever want to see the play, which I don't recommend you watching actually, but if you ever want to understand the history of robots, everybody dies at the end. They kill everybody. Uh, and this is what our Western culture from Frankenstein and other things have learned to expect from these artificial creatures that we're creating. Uh, I love science fiction as much as the next person, perhaps even more, but we also have to recognize that it is fiction uh, based on science, and we have to be careful how we move forward. We have to understand the risks associated with things, but there are potential benefits from the use of different forms of technology, including robots, and there are risks. And what the world is deciding right now through the United Nations and other aspects of the discussion that's going on as to what should we do? What is the right thing to do? And as you might imagine, just as there is for abortion or capital punishment or any major issue, there is a diversity of opinions. And uh, sooner or later, someone's gonna have to decide 
whether we ban this technology, whether we regulate this t technology, or whether we just be laissez-faire and let, let happen what happens. Uh, hopefully not the latter. Okay, so let's talk about this. We're, we're trying to figure out what we should do with what we'll call lethal weapons, lethal autonomy. So we'll use lethal autonomy instead of killer robots for, for the duration. Um, so what are the ethics of this lethal autonomy? I mean, we've had wars and, and people have been fighting each other for eons and eons. So what are the ethics of, of what we're doing when we're thinking about robots in this space? Well, the ethical discussions surrounding warfare have been going on for thousands and thousands of years uh, with codification since the 1800s and the Geneva Conventions and the Hague Conventions as the oxymoronic statement of what is the legal way to kill each other in the battlefield? What is the appropriate way? One a pacifist would argue, and I encourage pacifists to argue for this as well too, uh, that killing each other is wrong, period. Uh, and I'm sympathetic to that particular uh, point of view. But since time immemorial, going back to the very beginnings of history, we can see that human beings have engaged in warfare in a variety of different ways, engaging in genocide and homicide and all sorts of horrific uh, infanticide, all sorts of things through, uh, throughout history. Around the last couple of hundred years, we have started to put international law, as I mentioned, it's, it's referred to as IHL, or International Humanitarian Law, as a means to regulate the right ways to conduct warfare, potentially with minimization of damage to non-combatants and non-combatant property. That's where my particular concern comes in. I am deeply concerned with how we can find ways to reduce the slaughter of innocents in the battle space, how we can do that effectively using technology, and by using machines that could potentially outperform human beings with respect to enforcing international humanitarian law, I argue that that's one way in which we should continue to explore the use of this technology uh, in current warfare scenarios. So basically you're saying robots could enable um, a humane war. I mean, maybe an oxymoron, but... Well, I've... One could say humane war, but that is an oxymoron, and I agree with you uh, on that, but it could potentially produce better outcomes than we are currently getting with uh, existing human warfighters who are subject to all kinds of stresses and strains, even more now due to the tempo of the battlefield uh, increasing more than it ever has due to technology. How can we reduce the anger and fear or eliminate the anger and fear and frustration associated uh, with human battle uh, warfighters uh, in the battle space? How can we ensure that they don't suffer from certain cognitive problems like scenario fulfillment, which led to the downing of an Iranian airliner uh, many years ago in the, uh, uh, due to problems of operator uh, perspective in these kinds of systems? There are all kinds of things that go wrong, even just carelessness and accidental uh, problems, let alone the atrocities that human warfighters commit. Could we do better? And I'm not saying that we necessarily could do better, uh, but I'm saying that it is an important and valid research question that we have to explore because the stakes are so high. The slaughter of innocent combatants goes on daily uh, in the world, in the battle space, and people are not paying adequate attention to it. And technology can, must, and should make a difference in the ways in which we engage each other uh, in warfare to minimize uh, civilian casualties. Uh, and if, it, if the discussion leads to the point where those argue that we should ultimately ban lethal autonomous weapons in the battlefield, I've always said I'm not aversive to it. Uh, but what I will say is that doesn't mean that we should ignore the problems that exist within the battle space. And more and more people need to look at ways to reduce civilian casualties. And I would just charge those who say, let's ban this technology, to say that we need to find ways to reduce civilian casualties and tell me what you're going to do. So, so basically, the, the social aspects of, of war and, and the emotional reactions that soldiers might have, we can mitigate a little bit. Um, so if I think about banning and I think about, so that's like the extreme versus really think about the technology and designing it so that it, it takes into consideration pros and cons of any decision. How do we ensure then that our machines can do that? Because typically, if you think about it, we are using probably our soldiers and our experts to train these machines based on, I guess, conventions of war and things like that. How do we make sure that they're not biased in any way? 
Bias is one aspect, certainly, as well, too. But let me back up just a little bit to give you a, a, a broader perspective. It should be recognized that these systems will never, in my mind, uh, fully replace human warfighters in the battle space. Uh, the key factor is using the strengths of both technologies, autonomous systems, and human decision-making uh, as appropriate. Keeping humans in the decision process at an appropriate level is important, where they can make rational and appropriate uh, decisions. Where they have difficulty is where these systems should be used. There's something referred to as bounded morality, which means that we're not trying to encode the entire Geneva Conventions and all of human moral reasoning into these platforms. That's not possible in the near to mid future, I would contend. But we can put within these systems the morality that's required for very uh, localized situational awareness in certain circumstances, such as a building clearing operation, or a counter sniper operation, or operations in the demilitarized zone which don't require everything uh, that needs uh, a human being would bring to bear on those uh, higher level decisions. But we can train them in the same sorts of ways that we train humans. The worst thing that you would do is give a, a human soldier a gun and say, okay, go out in the battlefield and figure out what's right and what's wrong. We give them instruction, we tell them, uh, we formally teach them what is the Geneva Conventions and what you're allowed to use. We provide them with rules of engagement, which say that these are acceptable ways to use force, and these are unacceptable ways uh, to use lethal force. And uh, robots can take those same rules and laws in these narrow bounded sets of circumstances, if we get it right, and that's still a big if, uh, and potentially create better outcomes. That's the point I'm trying so to make. we can teach robots basically how we try to teach humans to be good we could use the same sets of rules. We won't quite teach them the same way uh, uh, because we won't put them in a classroom, so to speak, and, and learn them and make them take an exam. But hopefully we can have proficient programmers who can find ways to embed these rules within their programming and to test and verify that they are indeed, under certain circumstances, behaving appropriately, even more so than human beings. And it's my contention, if we can't outperform human warfighters with respect to ethical compliance, these systems should not be fielded. So who is part of this conversation? Is it, is it, is it you and you're standing up and you represent all roboticists? Or <laughs> you know, is it you against the world? Are there roboticists and computer scientists as, long, as well as philosophers, as well as lawyers? I mean, is this a unique community of everyone contributing to the conversation? Everyone is contributing to the conversation in this, which is good. Uh, if you would have asked me 15 years ago when this conversation first started, there were a few lone voices actually har as harbingers of the, uh, uh, the threat that was coming. Uh, and uh, some of my colleagues and I had debates early on with respect to these particular issues, which has helped to raise consciousness uh, of the problems and the potential benefits that these systems uh, can have. But it has expanded uh, clearly into philosophy. Philosophers are ethicists, uh, and it's crucial to have them into the discussion, as are theologians, uh, as are uh, military people, the users of this technology, uh, and average people as well, too. The ways in which we go forward require discussion. You do, uh, you do not want to leave these decisions up to roboticists to make this. You want to make sure that the discussion is broad, policymakers have to be brought in, and the good news is those discussions are being had. Whether it will result in something useful remains to be seen, but at least we're talking about it now. So here's a question for you. So a lot of these are about war and about lethal weapons. Um, I'm gonna turn it into like the uh, more domestic space. Because, of course, that's going to be the next step. Should we arm police drones, for example? What are your thoughts about that? I am currently, until I learn a better reason otherwise, uh, against using these, uh, this technology in uh, domestic settings. There, it's just a different kind of operation when you're using it against your own citizens. And there's posse comitatus and other aspects as well, too, about using military in uh, domestic circumstances. But we already don't use flamethrowers and we don't use tanks and bazookas. Uh, some technology is appropriate to import, but it's, it's also the other way around. For example, tear gas is perfectly acceptable in domestic settings, and it is a crime if you use it in war uh, settings. It's because you're not allowed to use gas warfare. Um, there's 
but just different sets of rules. Even the military has something called the rules of the use of force instead of rules of use, uh, engagement under domestic type of situations. Um, but you do have to be concerned about what's called civilian blowback, where this technology may find itself into uh, domestic hands, maybe not our country, but maybe other countries as well too, and used against civilian populations. And that's uh, one of the major points that opponents uh, to the technology uh, bring up. Because there might be a fear that it will come back home. Yeah. Understand. So I think that probably frightens a lot of us. Um, I can see some good because then you don't have the emotional aspects of uh, peacekeepers in the domestic space. So, so what can I do? Maybe I'm pro, maybe I'm con, maybe I think that this is the best thing, and maybe I'm just like, nah, I, I, I'm not quite sure. So what, what can I do? Well, there's so many opportunities now to get engaged in the discussion in so many different ways. Uh, of course, again, uh, get educated is the first thing. Try and read about what the issues are associated with this. Do not read uh, newspaper headlines, I guess, is the... Uh, is the best thing because they, uh, I didn't say don't read the newspaper article, but the headlines are always there to uh, serve as clickbait basically and get you to look at the article uh, in, the, uh, in the first place. But then have meetings, whether it's with your book reading club or whether it's a church group or whether it's a political group or take classes or speaking to your congressman or depending upon where you are in the geopolitical power structure, uh, Engage, get educated, and then engage, and make recommendations. It's up for everybody to engage in this particular discussion, and uh, I, I, I've always said I tend not to be prescriptive. I don't want to enforce my own personal beliefs on others as to what's right and wrong, but I do want people to make up their own minds, and we need to find ways to be able uh, to have that happen. But there are many venues, the White House has had discussions, um, there are meetings, I'm traveling all around the world talking about this as well too. Many other people are doing the same. Uh, get engaged if, if you're opposed to it. There's a campaign uh, against killer robots. It's a collection of national, uh, uh, of NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, including uh, Human Rights Watch is one of the leaders. Uh, you can get involved with that and hear their points of view. There's a lot of literature on the United Nations uh, webpage, United Nations Geneva uh, webpage, to, to read up and see the different perspectives, and even follow the discussions. Uh, but don't let this happen without your voice. That's the important thing. So get involved. Exactly. Well, I thank you for this conversation. So it's a tenuous time when you consider the importance of ethics in AI discussions. Right now, technology is advancing at a pace that is so difficult for researchers, philosophers, policy experts even, to keep up with. The advice, as Professor Ron Arkin says, is to get involved, become engaged in the conversation. Whatever your opinions are, have a voice in the conversation. I would like to thank Professor Ron Arkin again for joining us. And don't forget to keep up with Ron and myself as we join other roboticists and robot ethics experts on September 25th in Washington, DC. Make sure you subscribe to our show. And as always, follow the School of Interactive Computing on Twitter and Facebook at IC at GT.